Dr. John Overton and welcome back to episode 3 of Ultra Frontier Explorer here on alwaysaround.net. Today, in recognition of the first ever Asteroid Day on June the 30th, we're going to be looking at how humanity can defend ourselves from impacts by near-Earth objects. Now, when most people think about asteroids and comets impacting with Earth, they think of the Chicxulub impact 65 million years ago, which caused a mass extinction, wiping out three quarters of animal and plant species on Earth, including all the dinosaurs except birds. The Chicxulub impactor was an asteroid approximately 12 kilometers in diameter and about 350 gigatons, that's 350 billion metric tons in mass. It entered Earth's atmosphere at a speed of about 80,000 kilometers per hour, and it struck what is now the Yucatan Peninsula with an explosive force equivalent to 130,000 gigatons of TNT, which is to say about 10 billion times the explosive power of the Little Boy atomic bomb, which was the atomic bomb that the USA dropped in World War II on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Now, the Chicxulub impact made a crater about 180 kilometers in diameter, and it caused a huge tsunami and threw up vast amounts of dust and debris into Earth's atmosphere, which rapidly spread around the globe and plunged the whole planet into a winter that lasted several years, um, which was the direct cause of the extinction of so many of the life forms on Earth at the time, what was called the Cretaceous slash Paleogene extinction event. The good news about these kind of enormous planet killer asteroids that are 10 kilometers or bigger in diameter is they only hit the Earth about once every hundred million years or so. And better still, there are only really three of them in the near Earth region, with the, the largest two being uh, 1036 Ganymed and 433 Eros, which are both about 34 kilometers in diameter. Um, however, even near Earth objects one kilometer or so in size would hit Earth with explosive equivalent of about 60 billion tons of TNT, which would probably destroy human civilization as we know it. <clears throat> Again, the good news is that these only strike Earth about once every 700,000 years. And out of the thousand or so near Earth objects in the one kilometer class that are predicted to exist, we have already spotted and are tracking 962 of these. Um, the largest potentially hazardous near-Earth object being 4179 Tutatis, which is about 4 by 2 by 2 kilometers in size, uh, with a mass of uh, 50 billion tons. <coughs> um, however, um, it has been uh, spotted and tracked, and its orbit has been predicted for the next 600 years or so, with an estimated zero chance of striking Earth. So. We know where almost all of these really big near-Earth objects are. But wait, what about the middling and smaller near-Earth objects? Well, right down at the small end, say 10 meters or less, almost all of the objects that enter Earth's atmosphere burn or explode high up enough that they don't do any damage on the ground. Um, even though US Air Force recon satellites spot um, a one 10 meter object exploding with atomic bomb force high up in the atmosphere about once a year. You can see from this map of a 19 year period that the Earth is regularly peppered with these small asteroids without coming to much harm. So much for small near Earth objects. But wait, what about the middling sized near Earth objects of sizes say 20, 40 and 60 meters plus in diameter? Now here's the rub. It's this size class, especially the 40 meter plus size, that are called city killers. And there's about one million of them in near Earth space. 
And so far, we've only found about 10,000 of these. So we only know where about 1% of these city killers are. This first annual asteroid day is being held on June the 30th because it's the anniversary of the 1908 Tunguska event, when an object estimated to have been between 40 to 60 meters in diameter of a mass of about 100,000 tons entered the Earth's atmosphere at 54,000 kilometers an hour and was rapidly heated by the ram pressure and friction with the air to about 25,000 degrees centigrade, causing it to explode about eight kilometers high above the forest near the Tunguska River in Siberia. The explosion was about 15 megatons in power equivalent to about a thousand times more than the little boy atomic bomb. Now, at the time, faraway seismic detectors registered a 5.0 on the Richter scale. And when, after 20 years of effort, Leonid Kulik's expedition finally reached the extremely remote area of the impact zone, they found about 80 million trees across a 2100 kilometer squared area have been stripped to their branches and flattened like toothpicks. The same kind of forest crushing that was seen more recently in the 1980 eruption of the Mount St. Helens volcano. The Tunguska impact's massive area of devastation was about the size of a large modern metropolitan city. The locals at the time told how hundreds of reindeer had been killed and gave eyewitness testimony of the impact event itself. The uh, testimony of S. Semenov, who was 40 miles south of the Tunguska impact at the time. The sky split in two and fire appeared high and wide over the forest. The split in the sky grew larger and the entire northern side was covered with fire. At that moment, I became so hot, I couldn't bear it, as if my shirt was on fire. From the northern side, where the fire was, came strong heat. I wanted to tear off my shirt and throw it down. But then the sky shut closed, and a strong thump sounded, and I was thrown a few meters. I lost my senses for a moment, but then my wife ran out and led me to the house. After that, such noise came as if rocks were falling or cannons were firing, the earth shook. And when I was on the ground, I pressed my head down, fearing rocks would smash it. When the sky opened up, hot wind raced between the houses, like from cannons, which left traces in the ground like pathways, and it damaged some crops. Later, we saw that many windows were shattered, and in a barn, a part of the iron lock snapped. The Tunguska impact event is still to date the largest recorded natural explosion in human history. Now, as I said, there are about one million Tunguska-sized near-Earth objects out there, and they are expected to hit Earth about once every 300 to 400 years. But there are probably even more numerous near-Earth objects in the 20-meter class, which we might expect to hit Earth every 10 years or so. And even though they're not outright city killers, like the 40-meter-sized asteroids, they can still cause considerable damage and harm if we're unprepared for them. For example, in 2013, a 20-meter diameter impactor of mass about 13,000 tons, that's a little heavier than the Eiffel Tower, entered the Earth's atmosphere at 69,000 kilometers per hour and exploded in the air about 30 kilometers above the Russian city of Chelyabinsk with a detonation of about 500 kilotons of power, which is about 50 times the power of the little boy atomic bomb. This explosion damaged over 7,000 buildings and injured about 1,500 people, mainly from the flying glass of tens of thousands of windows that were shattered by the shock wave. The airburst above Chelyabinsk was captured in this spectacular footage where you can see the asteroid glowing brighter than the sun.
Now, before I go any further, I just want to say, don't panic. Unlike the dinosaurs, humanity has the knowledge and the ability to assess the risk of asteroid and comet impacts, and if necessary, potentially with the right funding and coordination, we could divert a massive object so it would miss Earth. And this is what Asteroid Day is all about. Waking the world up to the danger of near-Earth objects and getting the backing needed to defend planet Earth from them. Which leads to the question, how can we protect Earth from asteroid impacts? And I'll quote Don Yeomans of NASA here, the three most important things to attend to if you want to protect Earth from near-Earth object impacts is Number one, find them early. Number two, find them early. Number three, find them early. As I mentioned before, so far we have found and tracked a lot of the larger near-Earth objects. For example, if you have a look at this plot, uh, which was up to date in 2013, um, you can see all the uh, potentially hazardous orbits of near-Earth objects that are 140 meters or greater in diameter. As you can see, there's quite a lot of them, but at least we know where they are. Now, um, as also as I mentioned, to date, we've only found about 1% of the 40 meter plus city killer asteroids. Um, that Those 1 million objects that are just kicking around there in near Earth space, waiting to be found. So what is being done? to find and track the rest of the near-Earth objects. Well, there are a number of space guard efforts already underway. Um, for example, NASA's Near-Earth Object Program collates observations from a number of telescope teams and is currently focused on looking for near-Earth objects in the 140 meter class. The Sentry Automated Collision System scans um, various asteroid catalogues looking for predicted future impacts. The International Asteroid Warning Network was set up in 2013 to coordinate search and tracking efforts globally. NASA and the University of Hawaii are implementing the Atlas Asteroid Impact Early Warning System, which will use two telescopes 100 miles apart that will scan the whole sky several times a night. This should be able to provide short-term warning for about 50% of impactors. For example, we should get about a day's warning for a 30 kiloton town killer, a week's warning for a five megaton city killer, and about three weeks warning for a 100 megaton county killer from the Atlas system. While short-term warnings are good, it will be much, much better to follow Don Yeoman's advice and find them early. Whether we choose to follow a civil defense shelter or evacuate type of plan and or whether we choose to follow uh, the plan of diverting the asteroid away from Earth while it's still out in space. Now, the B612 Nonprofit Foundation was set up by engineers, scientists and astronauts to enhance our planetary defence capability. And they're working on something called the Sentinel mission, which is a plan to put a giant state-of-the-art telescope out in space beyond the interference of Earth's atmosphere, where it should be able to spot nearly all of the near-Earth objects, including the one million Tunguska size objects still undiscovered in near Earth space. Sentinel is projected to discover half a million near Earth objects in just its first six and a half years of operation. But the Sentinel mission needs financial backing because it's being run not by a government but by a separate non profit organization. The Sentinel telescope is projected to cost $450 million to build, launch and operate, which sounds like a lot, but when you think about it in terms of defence spending, one modern warship 
for just one nation's navy will cost upwards of a billion dollars. And for half that price, not only will the Sentinel telescope make a very significant contribution to defending the entire planet from harm, but it will also map out hundreds of thousands of near-Earth asteroids that will have the potential for space mining. Now, anyone can donate to help the Sentinel mission, but perhaps Earth's 1,800 billionaires might each like to reach into their pockets and donate a quarter of a million dollars, which, right there, would cover the costs of the entire mission. After all, what better legacy than to protect the entire planet?